All right, well, hello everyone in future generations. Uh, this is the Baltimore Science Fiction Society Oral History Project, uh, episode one, uh, wow. talking with Mr. Uh, David, David Edlin. Edlin. Um, my name is Mike Chaplinsky. Uh, you do not have to remember my name. This is all about him today. As if your ego needs I'm that much more. I'm just incredibly flattered. <laughs> I think we should, a good place to start is to talk about you, um, how you got into science fiction in general, where you come from, and also that'll lead right into uh, the formation of business. I think those, that's a good place to start. So please. Well, my introduction to science fiction was probably very typical of a lot of science fiction fans. I run out of sports books to read. <laughs> I read every single baseball book that existed in the Enoch Pratt Free Library in Baltimore and uh, picked up a couple of science fiction novels by some dude named Robert Heinlein. Ah, yes. You know, the, his juvenile science fiction was probably the entry for lots and lots of people in the 1950s and the early 1960s. And even me, but yeah. I mean, you know, you can only read so many sports books. Like, who knew there were actually three juvenile novels about marble shooting? I read them too. I was desperate to read sports books. But then I became a science fiction fan. Uh, in the late 1950s, I discovered Ace Books. Ah, yes. Ah, Ace Books. Double novels where you'd start reading from one side of the book, and when you got to the middle, that was the end of it, and then you would just flip the book over and start the other novel on the other side. So a neighbor of mine was intrigued. So we came with a deal that we would basically buy the books, chip in together, three for a dollar five brand new, just published Ace Novels. And the deal was he got to read them first, but I got to keep them. Nice, that is smart. And in the smart summer man. I would sit on my front porch while everybody else was engaged in sports. I was just this geeky 78 pound weakling. And what did I do? I would read three science fiction novels in an afternoon, which probably accounts for my craziness. <laughs> so obviously you're a, Balt you're a, you're a Baltimore native. Yep. So, so before, how did you, I know, I, I know that I've, I've heard the story that Bisphus came into being because of people going, wanting, going down to Washington, to the Washington Well, it, it goes society, back but, further than that. Yeah, please. If there were a birthing moment or a conception moment for Bisphus, it would be December 12th, 1960. I was a sophomore at Baltimore City College and uh, that afternoon, Baltimore was hit with an unexpectedly fierce snowstorm. Hmm. Weather forecasting then was not what it is now. Uh, for anything you might read in high-tech science fiction, <laughs> weather forecasting was incredibly primitive. And Baltimore was hit by a snow bomb. Hmm. It started, my recollection, is about 11 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, they didn't dismiss school right away. It was just snowflakes. <laughs> but by 1230, it became apparent that it was more than snowflakes, that it was getting ridiculous. So, of course, they dismissed school hmm. at one o'clock. Without having planned on buses that normally you would ride the Baltimore transit buses because they didn't have school buses in Baltimore, you rode public transit. And so all the kids are out on the bus stop and the snow is coming down fiercely. And finally, the number 22 bus that had a couple of seats in it came by. And of course, I hopped on, as did a whole bunch of other students. And we didn't realize that we were about to spend nine hours on a bus. Oh, wow. Uh, the snow was so bad. The, the city used to be very proud of the fact that its buses could go in snow, but that was a big lie. <laughs> the buses were paralyzed. And uh, just sitting there, what are you going to do? And then I noticed on the back seat, there was a guy reading a science fiction novel. I thought, whoa. You remember what novel? Nope, I don't <laughs> remember. I think it was a fantasy press. Oh, okay. whatever, whatever it was, it was a fantasy press hardback. 
And I just naturally gravitated to the back of the bus and engaged this guy in conversation. And the guy was Jack Chalker, who uh, was in the 11th grade, whereas I was in the 10th grade. Uh, someone who I've not only read, but I've actually met. God yeah, well, you know, and so we got to talking and Jack told me about the fact that there are actually clubs, organized science fiction fans all over the country, which was a great revelation to me. So we, we talked for several hours. I mean, we were on the bus for almost nine. Jack has varying versions of when he got off the bus. I don't really remember. I mean, we're talking 1960. Yeah. And this is 60... Three years later, almost 63 years after that December storm. Yeah, yeah. And some fine points disappear. I don't remember where he got off the bus or the National Guard coming to rescue us. <laughs> wow. Which is part of his story of the, the founding of, you know, <laughs> all of this. Pity we can't call But him. I didn't get off the bus until we got to Park Circle, where I had to transfer buses to get home, but there weren't any buses to transfer to. <laughs> So I took refuge in a white coffee pot restaurant that was then at the corner. Mm. And uh, they had a pay phone and I called home and said I was alive. And a neighbor with snow tires managed to come down and, and rescue me from the white coffee pot restaurant. <laughs> it took me about 10 and a half hours to get home from wow. school. Nine hours of it trapped on one bus. With Jack Chalker, no less. Most of it with Jack Chalker. <laughs> so this planted the seed. Mm. And of course, I didn't have a whole lot of friends. I was a science fiction fan. And in those days, anybody who read that crazy Buck Rogers stuff was like a social outcast. What was the point? Mm. So I was on the phone constantly with Jack. And then I would visit him at his house. I'd ride my bicycle from Ricerstown Road and Cold Spring Lane, which is near yeah. my, you know, I would go kind of like on the side streets across the Liberty Heights Avenue, where his address, I believe, was 5111 Liberty Heights Avenue. Mm -hmm. And it got to be like a routine for me on my no-speed bike. No, no gears in those days, you just pedaled. Mm. But I was pretty good at it. It was the only sport I was good at was riding my bicycle. <laughs> and it got to the point where I wouldn't go home. I would just pack up a little bag of whatever I needed and told my parents, well, I'm going over to Jack's house. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay. So that was the first, kind of the first proto Bisphus clubhouse. Jack became my best friend in high school. And, you know, I, I, his parents were like very different from my parents. They taught mm. me to play pinochle. Ooh. They were very competitive when it came to, to oh. games, but most particularly double pinochle in which you played partner's game, and I was usually Jack's mother's partner. Mm. And uh, Jack's partner was his father. And uh, his mother would uh, emphasize no table talk, like no giving oh. away what's in your hand. At the same time, she would be kicking my ankle <laughs> about the play I was about to make. <laughs> sort of like, don't do it, boom, boom. You didn't work on a code or anything? No, like, no, uh, but, uh, okay. but I knew when she was kicking me that it meant that she had a powerhouse hand. Cool. So, so. All right, so, so you starts, you, you and, yeah. it starts with you and Jack's friendship. Yeah, and How and did then, you find then, more people of your, well, like well, mine? You must have. Well, then Jack told me that, you know, he was going to science fiction club meetings in Washington. WSFA. Or, for those who've never heard of it, the Washington Science Fiction Association. And they had meetings on the first and third Fridays and party nights on the fifth Friday mm. at the home of a woman named Elizabeth O. Cullen, who is the oldest woman I'd ever met socially. Mm. I don't think she was a science fiction fan. I think she was just amused by us. <laughs> but she allowed her house to be used for WSFA meetings and parties. And... Uh, she was, she like worked for the railroad. She was some sort of lobbyist on Capitol Hill. <laughs> she had, she knew extraordinary people. There was an autographed copy of a book by Douglas MacArthur sitting in her library. Nice. Uh, I would sit during the meetings on an old Western saddle she had mounted on like a, a thing that sort of like get the feel of being a Western cowboy sitting there. 
know, a bunch of enchanting people. Very cool. All so, of them older than me. Well, yeah, it goes without saying. That, that, that yeah. happens, I mean, that was part of my experience too, like all these people yeah. who seemed a lot older, they were probably only yeah. like five now, years older. Getting to Washington meetings was a bit of a challenge because, well, we weren't old enough to have driver's licenses. So we would get downtown to the trailway station, never Greyhound, we always rode trailways, mm -hmm. which seemed to us just like an upgrade over Greyhound. Mm. And we would go from the downtown Baltimore Trailway Station, which was on Fayette Street, and uh, get to DC's bus terminal and catch a cab. In those days, cabs were incredibly cheap. Yeah. And in Washington, they were the cheapest anywhere because they operated on a zone system. Yeah. And for some reason, Elizabeth Cullen's house on, I think it was West Beach Drive, which was not the same as East Beach Drive. They were on opposite sides of Rock Creek Park. Yeah. I, I, I work in Washington. I, I've learned that the hard way. Yeah, we, we had to sometimes explain to cab drivers <coughs> where West Beach Drive was. <coughs> Excuse me. This sort of the Calorama neighborhood. It was a wonderful old house. And it got to the point where every two weeks we were taking the bus to Washington, <laughs> which was really quite crazy. And this, this went on for, you know, a year and a half before we even started thinking about do we really want to keep doing this? And then there were conventions, and Jack convinced me, well, let's go to PhilCon. I said, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> so I got to be friends with science fiction fans in Philadelphia. I remember the memories of these conventions were more like they were like parties. Mm -hmm. And there were, the usual party place was the home of a I, I thought of her as kind of old at the time, but she was probably only about 50 years old, a woman named Harriet Kolchak. <laughs> and, and she lived in a, in a row house that was a little older than, and seedier than the row, row house that I lived in, mm -hmm. but it was also a little larger. And there are all these science fiction fans and writers at the parties. Yeah, Elspreet DeCamp was a Philly guy, as I remember. Yeah, and, and one I just, just remember better than any of the others was H. Beam Piper was at PhilCon. And I, you, know, you remember the weirdest thing, but he was this funny little guy wearing a tweed jacket and smoking English oval cigarettes compulsively. Hmm. And you know, I had a copy of Little Fuzzy and he autographed it and I still have it. It's one of the few books I have from those days <laughs> that you know I got signed. That's cool. And it's like, you know, not too many people have H. Beam Piper's autograph. No, he was, yeah. The he... poor guy committed suicide. Yeah. It was like, I don't know, understood why. Maybe he ran out of things to write. Yeah, I know, I, I, I know the, the generalities of his story, but it would, yeah. yeah. And I've read some of his stuff, obviously. It, but I amazing thought he was stuff. charming. And, and these are the formative things. Mm. Fifth Fridays were interesting because it was just a party. There was no business meeting and, and it was about fun. And as Jack recounts it in his Where We Started, the fateful moment was a New Year's Eve party at Wisva. And in the early morning hours of New Year's Day of 1963, mm -hmm. we were on a Greyhound bus coming home. Now, I don't remember it being a New Year's Eve party. I would have thought it was the fifth Friday party, but that would have made it, I looked it up. Well, it would have made it December 28th. Oh. But maybe it was a New Year's Eve party. I'll give it Jack credit. He said the snowstorm we were trapped on the bus was December. I thought it was January. I looked it up today. Okay. So Jack had it right, and I'm assuming, yeah, it was a New Year's Eve uh, party. You know, what the, what is it? time is relative. So we're on a Trailways bus about 2 o'clock in the morning heading back to Baltimore. And I came up with, like, Jack, you know, we don't have to keep going to Washington for science fiction club meetings. Why don't we start one in Baltimore? And we engaged in a discussion that lasted perhaps 10 minutes. And there were just a few of us on the bus. There was me, Jack Chalker, his girlfriend at the time, Enid Jacobs, uh, Mark Owings, maybe, uh, a guy named David Katz. Hmm. It was a curious little assemblage. No, Jerry Jacks. It wasn't David Katz. It was Jerry Jacks. And we were just trying to figure out, 
what would be the logistics if we had a club in Baltimore? And I came up with the bright idea of saying, well, we don't want to compete with Washington. Why don't we have our meetings on the second and fourth Saturdays? And then I threw in just for fun. And if we have a sixth Saturday, we can have a party. <laughs> Makes sense. Check your calendars, folks. There oh, yeah. are no six Saturdays. <laughs> You're right. There's, there are there are there are fifth month. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So every day's a party at Pistos. <laughs> if I were to pick an anniversary date for the first meeting of the Baltimore Science Fiction Society, it would have been the second Saturday of January of 1963. And the birthplace was my family's house a row house in northwest Baltimore below St. Ambrose Church, 3424 Royce Avenue. Uh, we met in the basement. There were, you know, maybe eight of us. Uh, the basement was not really great. In fact, I like the fact that in the clubhouse here, there's a concrete floor. <laughs> because that was basically, if you, if you had a row house in Baltimore, you either had an unfinished basement with a dirt floor or you had concrete. I had concrete. Mm -hmm. And in, in darkness of night, water bugs would sneak out of the crevices and, and be quite scary. Eey. And there Very weren't atmosphere. all that many seats, so some of us would just sit on the floor. The good thing about the house was that we had a liquor supply. My father was a clothing store salesman and manager, and he would often win awards for selling things. And a lot of times it was liquor, and he didn't drink. <laughs> so we would find the bottle of gin upstairs and, and uh, learn how to make things like the Singapore sling became like the, the drink of choice for us juveniles who shouldn't be drinking at all. <laughs> the numbers of people showing up at the meetings gradually increased to 10, 12, 14 maybe would be the biggest. And then we started thinking, well, this is not the greatest of meeting places in the basement. I mean. You have to picture the basement. There was like this big oil burner there. Mm. And in the winter, when it went on, there would be this little roaring noise as, as the <laughs> ignition hit. And so we started meeting at other people's houses. And that began a series of floating meeting places, mm -hmm. none of which I remember. Well, 14 people. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> uh, it's interesting. If you look at how life turns out for you, how you end up at the place you are to say this is a defining moment this is this is the instant that created the rest of my life and for me it was being caught on a bus in a snowstorm with Jack Chalker because that led to the Baltimore Science Fiction Society it led to me publishing my inept attempt at a fanzine I wasn't sure it was going to be any good I thought it would be an embarrassment it, it, it was called Gigantic, mm. and it was all of two pages long, two-sided. Well, yeah, good, which that, is really one sheet. Yeah, but still, you, and, you, did, you did it. <laughs> yeah, and, and I called it Gigantic because I decided I better not do this under my own name. So I invented a character whose name was Gino Johnson, <laughs> whose nickname was Gigantic because he was gigantic. And he lived in the basement at 3424 Royce Avenue. <laughs> The home of David Etlin. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. <laughs> and in order to publish it, I did not have the equipment, but I had a typewriter. I'd learned to type when I was 14 and taught myself the Columbus system. Mm -hmm. Discover a key and then you land on it, which <laughs> I still use to this day. It's very, it, very useful. It's amazing system. how yeah. that's, one, that's one technological skill that'll never go out of style. So I learned how to cut a mimeograph stencil. And all I had to do was put it into a mailing tube and send it to a guy in Canada whose name I no longer remember, but he was involved in an amateur press association. And they produced lots of fanzines, little ones, and mostly he ran them off on his electric mimeograph. And all you would have to pay for is the ink and the paper and a contribution towards postage, which in those days was incredibly cheap. And a wad like that of amateur fanzines would arrive in the mail every month or so. And so Gigantic went out to a mailing list of whatever he had. Gino Johnson got a fan letter mm. from a young lady in New Jersey whose last name was Johnson. <laughs> uh, 
And so he engaged in correspondence with said young lady who was 16. Mm. And it led to amazing adventures and eventual matrimony. Nice. Yeah. Whereabouts in Jersey? Do you uh, remember? At the time, uh, it was Wyk Wyk no, no, it was at the time it was uh, Hawthorne, New Jersey. Okay. And uh, and her, her her real name was Candace, but the name she adopted was Val. And people may remember Val Johnson if they're old enough. I've I've heard it. I don't remember context, but it sounds familiar. And uh, so we ended up being a thing, and then at when. The weekend of her 18th birthday, we secretly got married. I was 19, and uh, she became Val Etlin. Bravo. We, we informed our parents about six weeks later. Well, you know, they had as an, you do. They had an engagement party for us, and that's when we <laughs> called them aside and said, <laughs> "By the way, by the way, <laughs> we already got married." <coughs> and, and that lasted 10 years. Produced a kid, and then, for various and sundry reasons. She wanted out of Baltimore and out of the marriage and moved to Florida, hmm. where she moved in with Jack C. Haldeman II, whose marriage had ended, and, and she married into the Haldeman clan. That, that was... Is, uh, is, now, Jack is not... Is Joe's brother or Joe? Yeah, or, or, Joe's brother. Okay, I was going to say, wait a minute. No, it's not... Because no, I know... I, Joe's I, I, older I, brother. Oh, okay. Yeah. Now, interestingly, <laughs> Jack and Joe were both Blissfuss members early in the club's oh, that's existence. That I, did, that I did not know. Yeah. We, we had <clears throat> a lot of interesting characters who showed up. Uh, they weren't, I think Joe was there less often. Jay was there a fair amount of the time. We sucked in Roger Zelazny. I was going to say, I was going to say, what, what do you remember about Mr. Zelazny? Well, I always called him Brother Roger <laughs> because he was sort of like the brother I never had. And he was a regular at meetings. He was working for the Social Security Administration as a writer. He was producing pamphlets for the public explaining Social Security law and writing science fiction in his spare time. And uh, he wasn't all that well known, but we were pretty impressed because, wow, you know, he's really sold some stories. Yeah. And he got married the second time, and his wife hated his furniture. I had an apartment at the time on North Avenue, north near Maryland Avenue, mm -hmm. on top of a, a savings and loan association. My address was actually 31 West North Avenue. And it was an enormous apartment. It was about half the length of a football field. Wow. Just had these big open rooms. And what it lacked was enough furniture, and we were having meetings there. So Roger gave me all of his furniture <laughs> because his wife hated it. <laughs> well. And he got her furniture. So we were furnished by Roger Zelazny. Very and, cool. And that, that was pretty extraordinary. Well, uh, that's lovely. Please continue. I, you, should you should keep talking, and unfortunately, I can't be here to listen I, to it. Well, that's... <laughs> That's fine, but I, I will continue on. Please, definitely. I encourage you. Yeah. And the only other question I would ask, and I think would be, would be interesting to find out about, because currently Bisphus, from the meetings I've come to, very well represented, almost majority women. I'm curious to know if, like, how many, how long it took for it just to be, to go from being a bunch of weird guys to a bunch of weird people. And you might have seen some of that. Well, you know, the, the first female member was Enid Jacobs. And, and she and Jack, I don't know, I can't remember how long their relationship lasted. Uh, there were, there was probably just guys beyond, besides that in the very beginning. And then, you know, a few came along and then gradually the demographics of the club changed. And well, well, again, I must, I really got to hit the road. And I keep telling myself I love my job, I love my job, I love my job. Yeah, well. A pleasure as always. Hope right. I'll see you soon. So can I ask, is it true that Pat Kelly's car frequently broke down in front of Roger Lazenby's house? It's possible, but I don't remember. Oh, um, the oh, I, I don't know who I heard. Sue, would you start by giving your name, too? I use Sue Wheeler for... 
Baltimore Science Fiction Society. Just so, that was on so, so back to Roger Zelazny, yeah. uh, brother Roger. Uh, during his tenure with the Baltimore Science Fiction Society, uh, he basically was doing well writing science fiction. He was also doing very well at Social Security, and his writing talent came to the attention of the Commissioner of Social Security, who asked him if he would be willing to accept a promotion to some ridiculously high government service, GS rating. I think it was like a promotion from GS-15 to GF-16, and he could become the speechwriter for the Commissioner of Social Security. And Roger's reply was basically, well, no, actually, I'm thinking of quitting and writing science fiction full time. And that's what he did. He left Social Security. Uh, at the time, Roger was living in Ten Hills, which is a neighborhood that was fairly convenient to Social Security on the western edge of Baltimore City. Uh, basically, it was a row house, just a little newer than the row house that I started the club in. And uh, then he moved to University Parkway in a what we call a semi-detached house, but it was a lot larger than your standard row house. And uh, then he sold a script, sold a novel, Damnation Alley, for a movie script. And there was a strike in Hollywood that delayed its production, but when the strike finally ended, uh, Roger got an enormous amount of money. He sold his house and he moved to New Mexico. So that was really kind of the end of our relationship with Roger. But the club continued to grow. Uh, during this time period, I found employment in a very compelling business called News. I had gotten a job at the Baltimore Sun in 1967 as an editorial assistant. In 1968, I was promoted to reporter. And I hate to say that I went gaffia, getting away from it all. But my association with fandom became very loose beginning probably in the mid to late 1970s. And the club went on in the different incarnations. Uh, eventually they rented a clubhouse a couple different places before eventually buying this old movie theater building and becoming distinctive in science fiction fandom as one of the very few clubs that actually owns its own clubhouse. And the fact that six decades after it started it's still here and bigger than ever just gladdens my heart that you can't imagine that something that you were instrumental in starting would, through various incarnations, still be happening. What's your take, Sue? On what? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean, Mike? When did you get into it? Oh, when did I get into it? Um, it depends on what you mean by get into it. Um, I think I just told a story to somebody here. Uh, and how? <laughs> uh, yeah, how? Um, <laughs> Okay, so 1971, I'm getting some kind of, oh, is that you? That's okay. me. My hearing aid. Um, in 1971, uh, a group of students from Towson, that was the year I graduated, but anyway, there was this group that decided that they were going to, somebody invited them to a costume party. The costume party was at the Lord Baltimore. Okay, that's all I remember except they hated my costume. My sister put together something for me because I, I don't dress up. This is dressing up for me. So 1971, I went to this costume party and it was in the Lord Baltimore. And that's all I know for sure. 1972, in February, I saw this little blurb about this big in the sun that said there was going to be a science fiction convention at the Lord Baltimore. So I went down to the Lord Baltimore and ran into mostly, I think mostly male fans who were thrilled to see me. And they kept telling, they started telling me about all these, there's all these other conventions, you can go to this and this. So in 1972 I attended my first Worldcon in LA. 
and 73, no, 73 was Australia, right? Didn't go to Australia, haven't been to Australia yet. 74 was Discon. And I can't remember who said, whether it was my right idea or what, but somebody said, well, why doesn't Baltimore have a club? And to be honest with you, I don't remember. I know Dale's copied stuff in, uh, has found stuff in early fanzines that talks about who was a, 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 1974, after the World Con, when people were saying to me, so why doesn't Baltimore have a club? Or I was, I don't know. A um, bunch of us got together at my apartment. That was on Belvedere Avenue. And I remember, I'm sure Pat Kelly was there, and I'm sure Mark Owings was there, and according to what Dale has unearthed, there was some woman there whose name I don't remember, who I don't name, I don't recognize. But anyway, we all said, well, we'll put on a con. And then, or before we did it, um, well, okay, I'm getting, First, we went to Ted Paul's <laughs> and said, you've been running, you know, Balticon by yourself for some time. Is it all right? No, that's not right. 73, because we didn't do this until, yes, we did. It was 75. Ah, jeez. Somebody hand me a program book. All right. But at some point, we went to a pet, Ted Paul's and said, would it be all right if, the, if we all took over Balticon? And he said, I, re it was, I think it was a lot of work for him, and I do remember sitting there with him at one point, and he's counting up the money and discovering he had actually $100 left over after expenses. Um, dang. Like I said, somebody give me a program book. Um, <laughs> So the so he said, sure, you guys can go ahead and do it. And a bunch of us sat down and said, okay, if we don't make any money, I have I can scrape up fifty dollars. We can all scrape up fifty dollars. But we had Isaac Asimov and a robot, radio controlled, but that's okay. The kids liked it, and never had have not lost money as far as I know, probably made more or less over the years since, but it would have to be, I mean, with, you know, it's, it, it wasn't a World Con, it was a Walter Con, right? But it's after the 74. The, the they were all bigger than the first Balticon and okay. the second Balticon. I, I wish I could remember the first Balticon. I was there. And it's completely absent from my memory. Maybe because we didn't have a program, we didn't have a guest of honor. It was just like arranging a party, and some people came from out of town. The second Balticon was Sam Delaney as the guest of honor, and I distinctly remember that being at the Lord Baltimore. Jack's history of Busfus was that the first Balticon was at the Emerson Hotel. I wish I could remember having a con at the Emerson Hotel. But Balticon II was at the Lord Baltimore. Yeah. And my recollection was that we had to have 10 rooms booked in order to have our meeting room for free. Okay. Well, Jack had a larger number. I don't think that many people came to Balticon II. But it was a small turnout. And I think there were nine rooms that were taken. And so Jack got the 10th room and our meeting room was covered because paying for the meeting room would have been much more expensive than the cost of renting a hotel room. Uh, I've been to most of the Balticons since then, some just dropping in for a couple of hours for old time's sake. A couple of times I managed to ignore the fact that I would, had a vested interest in the club and covered the event for the Baltimore Sun, which I probably shouldn't have done, but I tried to write things yeah. straight and, and do a story that didn't make fun of the event, that looked at the science as well as the science fiction aspects. 
And I, I'm kind of proud of the stories I did journalistically. I thought that they were pretty nice. Are there any items from those stories that you particularly remember? Well, one, one of the great moments was at Hunt Valley Inn. Isaac Asimov was, I don't know whether he was the guest of honor at that convention. He probably was. And I asked him if we could sit down and, and I could do an interview. And he suggested having brunch. And it was Easter. And the Hunt Valley Inn was well known for its Easter brunch, which was just an enormous amount of food, all you can eat. And I sat with Asimov for about two and a half hours talking, recording a lot of it. And other people would occasionally just move into the booth with us or the, the t this table and join in the conversation. Uh -huh. And for a while, it was like me, Asimov, L. Sprague de Camp and his wife, and then there'd be science fiction fans. And it was like, why don't we have a, like having brunch with Isaac Asimov was a real thrill. Mm -hmm. Asimov was charming. He was one of the most accessible writers that I ever met. The first time I met him was at the first Discon in 1963. And I ran into him in the hotel lobby and I said, can you wait right here? I have some books I need signed. So he said, okay. So he sat down on a chair in the lobby. I ran to the elevator up to my room and I came back with a shopping bag full of Asimov paperbacks. And he dutifully signed every mother one of them. Like a nice man. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I as actually- As long as you didn't mind being pawed a few times, but I tape never record, happened to me, I tape so. recorded Discon 1. I, I brought my family's huge reel-to-reel -reel tape deck, and I filled six large two-hour reels of tape with the proceedings of the World Science Fiction Convention, including the opening sword fight between George Sithers and Fritz Leiber. <laughs> that I remember. Yeah, yeah. You know, I could hear the clanging of the steel. And, and I still remember Asimov gave a program what should a bug-eyed monster look like? <laughs> and somewhere in my basement archive, which if you remember the last scene of Raiders of the Lost Ark, somewhere in my basement, there is a box that has six real, large reel-to-reel -reel tapes with the proceedings of the 1963 Worldcon. If you ever find it, uh, I'm pretty sure Mistress would uh, welcome yeah, okay, this is I will find them because otherwise they're going to end up in a dumpster when I die. Seven inch reel? Or ten inch reel? Ten inch. Ten inch. Yeah. All right. If you can find something to play it on. We have resources. I'm sure we do. Yeah. And that's assuming they still work after being in storage since the 1960s. I, Scott Dorsey might be able to uh, ex, you know, make them work. Yeah. When you think about it, the first Balticon, the second Balticon, worrying about whether we have enough people to take up the room so that the meeting space is free, mm -hmm. and these problems, and compare it to, what was it, the 50th with George R. R. Oh, Martin, yeah. and 3,000 people showing up, like, it boggles the mind. And how science fiction over that period of time has evolved from outcast literature in a lot of ways. Literature that was ridiculed, uh, that crazy Buck Rogers stuff, to the point where science fiction is part of our daily life. Yeah. That not only do people read it and take the novel seriously, but so much of what was predicted in those science fiction novels of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s has come to fruition. So we were right. <laughs> well. Remember the, um, well, you don't, and I don't either, but years ago, this guy got hauled up by the FBI because he wrote a story about the atomic bomb. Yep, that's true Without story. knowing a thing about the atomic bomb actually existing. Um, Cleve. He, he, he had read the literature, what there was in the public domain, and he just extrapolated the possibility. Yeah, yeah, well, that's, this is the thing, yeah. And, well, and there's a lot of scientists who are writing science fiction or at least yeah. you know, you know, participating yeah. in science fiction. Yeah. In, in the evolution of 
Busfus and Balticon, one of the things that I am most impressed with is that there is a serious science track at every convention that we know that there is an interface between science fiction and science. And the people who have come and talked about the things that we're learning that were just the stuff of fantasy before really lends credence to my belief that science fiction has always been valuable literature and it's only gotten better as time well, has gone on. Years ago, it was, you didn't have, or very few of the pulps it got published in literary magazines, yeah. Saturday Review, places yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, every, everybody's got their favorite, favorite science fiction stories. I was very enamored of a guy named Clifford Simak. Yeah. And when he wasn't writing science fiction, he was a science and medical reporter for the Minneapolis Tribune, the Star Tribune now. And uh, I guess because he covered medicine, he should have known better than to smoke as much as he did because he was a chain smoker. I only met Simak one time, but I was a big fan. And I guess it was around 1963, 64. I published my one and only real fanzine, a single issue called Yonder. And the thrust of the magazine was, the fanzine was looking at the Hugo likely contenders for that particular year. And some of them were basically reprints of earlier science fiction. And the one that most impressed me was Way Station by Cliff Simak. And so I wrote reviews of all the books that were talked about as possible contenders. And I, I managed to print about 500 copies of my fanzine and mail it out. God knows where I got the money from. And I was really, really big on Waystation, that you have to vote for Waystation. This is absolutely a great novel. And it squeaked through in the nomination. It didn't get nominated by a lot of votes, but it had enough. And my thinking was that probably a lot of people who got my fanzine, which was a very impressive looking fanzine for what it was worth, that they might have changed their minds and voted for that book. Well, I received a letter from Simak just before that science fiction convention. I forget whether it was where it was. It might have been Cleveland, wherever it was. Simak wrote me a letter and said that, don't tell anybody, but I've just been informed that I won the Hugo for best novel. They don't usually tell you ahead of time but I wasn't intending to go to the Worldcon, but now I've decided I'm gonna go and I'm gonna accept the award in person because I'm very flattered and, I'm th and I wanna thank you for your efforts on my behalf. It was a beautiful little letter for you know, a fan who'd never met Cliff Simak, but just absolutely adored his storytelling. And uh, a couple years later, he was a guest of honor at one of the very few University of Maryland science fiction yeah. convention. And I went down to meet him for the first time, got him to sign my books. I did an interview with him. And I wrote a story for the Baltimore Sun that I thought was really, really nice. And the future editor hated it and didn't run it. Mm. But what I remember about Simak in my interview with him, him telling me, was how distressed he was that he was not going to live to see man land on Mars. Mm. That he had hopes when we got to the moon in the 1960s that Mars was just another stepping stone and it was possible. And he came to the realization when the space program turned its focus entirely to satellite technology for years that we had turned away from exploring further into our solar system to the ex extent that we did. And I was always kind of like struck by that. And of course, he, he did end up dying. I'm pretty sure it was lung cancer. But I, I still go back and every now and then I read some of his, his stories. Got lots of stuff here you can reread. Uh, the, you, you pointed out, I'm kind of not going to cons anymore and just too lazy, I guess. But one of the great things about being a science fiction fan especially if you're a con fan as well, 
is interacting with the authors. I, I, I have a number of nice memories and some not so nice. Um, but I remember traveling with a couple that were members of Vispus at the time, but uh, it's been ages. Nobody here today would, or any at the next meeting would know the name. But we were going, I think, to a flange, and we were in this little hotel restaurant. And um, George, and I don't remember his wife's name, but they had a small child. And this kid was cranky as anything. Cranky, cranky, cranky. And they're trying. Suddenly he looks over and he's smiling away. At El Spray de Camp, way, wiggling his bushy eyebrows. Mm. <laughs> I, that's the kind of thing I. Yeah. Yeah. Like. The thing that strikes me about Busfus from the very beginning was that I found a sense of community with people who had that interest with me. And I think that that's one of the things that has survived all of these years is that when you fill this meeting room, this clubhouse, and, and it happens, I've been here and there have been some big crowds, is that is a great community. And, and I'm impressed that the club does things that are socially responsible in terms of fostering literacy, writing, uh, the fact that it had to fight to be, get, get nonprofit status. And one says just a lot about societal acceptance that this is a very legitimate organization that plays a useful role in society and does things that expand beyond its own doors into the community and fosters good. And, and you, you can't ignore that. Also, economically, when it has its conventions, it produces economic impact for the That's city right. of Baltimore. Well, the Renaissance keeps letting us come back. They are. Yeah, I mean, you know. <laughs> they don't seem to be unhappy about it. Yeah. And given how small the roots are. Oh, I know. You know you, it, it, it never ceases to impress me. You're, you're right about fandom, too. Um, so 1972 was my first World Con. I had no idea what I was doing. I booked my trip through American Express, um, not knowing that I, as a member of the con, I should get a discount on a hotel room. So I get, so I think I'm paying that, mm -hmm. what they said in their literature. I get to go to check out, and I'm three dollars short. <laughs> so. I don't remember who it was, but somebody, um, I don't think, uh, it was it, LA fan, Bruce, oh gosh, I mean, he's gone now. Um, Peltz? Yeah. Okay. Bruce and Elaine, yes. I think he came down, I, I think he, maybe he got them to take some off. Anyway, I was short $3. Somebody gave me the three dollars, and I returned it two or three years later at a Midwest con. Mid, I don't know if it was Midwest or a Midwestern con, mm. but but that's the thing. And um, the first time that we campaigned for a World Con, 1979, 1978, for the 1980 World Con. I think I attended, yeah, I attended 15 cons and mostly got put up by fans along the way. And uh, the other thing was, like I said, I'm Sue Wheeler. In those days when I had a landline, somebody called up and they asked for Sue's and I didn't know who they were talking to. Nah. If they asked for Sue Wheeler, I figured, okay, you got my name from somebody who actually knows me. Mm -hmm. So how are you? What do you need? You know. But now it doesn't matter so much because I just ignore the phone unless they leave a voicemail, right? But yeah, there was a lot of that. And again, it's always very interesting meeting some of these fans, doing crazy things, and it's always so interesting. Science, science fiction fandom changed my life in other ways. 
And I think that there are lots of folks in fandom who ended up marrying each other because of their intersection through science fiction. And, and Busfus has been responsible for several long-lasting relationships, some not so long-lasting relationships. Science fiction fandom in general does the same thing. And, you know, I, I find it kind of amusing that the first person I ever call a girlfriend, I met through attending meetings at WISFA. Right. And she was a girl who lived in Bethesda. And I started, I don't know why my parents let me use their car, but on Sundays I could drive when I got my driver's license to Bethesda every Sunday morning. And the requirement was if I was going out with her, I had to go with her family to the Unitarian Church, River Road Unitarian Church, uh, and then we would have lunch together at their house afterwards. And then we would go down to Great Falls of the Potomac and go rock climbing together. What was her name? Her name? Mary Kramer. And I have no idea what happened to her, but rumor would have it that she became a nuclear physicist and moved to Israel. I don't know. Mm. It's entirely possible. Uh, and and then, then I met Val and, uh, and we got together. And then she split and became a Haldeman and uh, I, I was looking around for, you know, another, you know, a replacement. <laughs> companion. Yeah, companion. I was, yeah. Right. <laughs> I was looking for sex. No, I, I, you, know, I, you know, what do you do? You know, so you go back to your roots and through science fiction, I, I meet a young lady in, in D.C. And... Uh, she was working as a waitress at a health food for restaurant called Food for Thought on DuPont Circle. And, and I was quite enamored of her. She was like a crazy red-haired hippie girl with the torn jeans and the bandana. And it turned out she had an uncle named Daniel Patrick Moynihan. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm seriously interested in her. She was quite exotic as far as I was concerned. I didn't know about Uncle Pat at the time. That became a surprise to me afterwards. But uh, I convinced her to move to Baltimore. I think she was perhaps having a little bit of money issues working as a waitress in a health food restaurant. Yeah. Not a very good one because who wants to put honey in your coffee? That was all they had. It was like a terrible thing. So I, I suggested she could move to Baltimore because I had this big house at the time on Calvert Street. I had an eight bedroom end of road Toad mini Hall. mansion called Toad Hall. So she agreed to move to Baltimore and in courting her, I booked us rides on, an, on elephants in the circus parade when Ringling Brothers came to town because I covered Ringling Brothers. I enjoyed the circus a lot. There was something fantastic about it. And so instead of falling madly in love with me, she ran off and joined the circus sure, for wow. a year, selling stuff on the circus trains and, and you know, in the circus, you know, in the stands and living on the train which is a really grubby existence. And somehow or another, she ended up hooking up with a writer named George R. R. Martin along that period of time. And they're still together almost half a century later. Yeah. And I find that extraordinary, you know, that, you know, how have our lives changed? You know. And, and the wife I ended up with was the upstairs neighbor when I was in my first marriage. Uh -huh. You know, it was like, you know, she was had nothing to do with science fiction. But our honeymoon was at Balticon. Yeah, well... She was seven months pregnant, and we went to Balticon for... My family, I mean... They just kind of tolerated it. Um, I know they read some science fiction... Uh, and not because it's fantasy or science fiction, but I have a sister who has a complete set of the Narnia Chronicles because her church approves of it. Uh, and, and Aslan is a god symbol. Oh, you, you knew that, right? Okay, sorry. You were frowning, and I'm thinking, well, there's a reason, but hey, when I went up to visit her, I got to reread all of them. Um, but one thing they did do, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. 
Um, it's a little early though. That's okay. Um, when we had to sell the farm, and um, I had to stay home and babysit. My older, the others came home and said, somebody came home and said, oh, we picked out the room for you. It was a walk-in closet with bookshelves. That's, that was my room. They mm -hmm. took one look and said, that's my room. Um, and the, the and I remember that chron uh, alphabetically, the first book on the shelf was uh, Martian Chronicles, Bradbury. Mm. Not B for Bradbury, not M for Martian. Um, and my mother, when I, when I was very young, I didn't realize that, I thought the due, due date in my library book meant I had to keep it <laughs> until January the 6th or whatever. So I, I so I think it, so we read some silly anyway, my mother went in and talked to her friend, the librarian, and got me permission to move out of the uh, grade one through three section into the four through six section. Mm -hmm. And I swear to God they had Pod Kane of Mars. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's where I read Pod Kane of Mars. But they also they had things like all the Andrew Lang mm -hmm. fairy tales. Um and I reread, and then I read other stuff. Um, I think libraries were very important in the early structure of growing the club, because I would go down to the Pratt Library downtown, and and I had little cards that I made up about the Baltimore Science Fiction Society, and I put a card <laughs> with the information in every single science fiction volume in the collection at the Pratt Central. Uh, Jack, in his history of Busfus, describes me as like, a recruiting fool <laughs> that I that, that that I don't think we found that many members by doing it no, through the library ask, yeah. but a few a few came well, along you never know and and you know I mean, we didn't have the internet I mean Lordy how can you reach lots of people that you don't know well you the letters columns in the science fiction magazines yeah there's that but you know I wasn't sophisticated enough to figure that part oh. out <laughs> But I went down to the library and I put little leaflets in, you know, in all the books. Uh, people I met at City College, you know, like David Katz was an early member. I don't know whatever happened to David. He was an interesting character. He I was like a course student at City, Baltimore City College, which is, for those who don't know, is the third oldest public high school in the United States, which among its alums, besides me and Jack Chalker and, and the very famous Nobody ever heard of him after that, David Katz, who his grades were much better than I. My yearbook has a picture of him in the chemistry lab with a huge flame shooting out of a Bunsen burner, like there was some explosion in progress. Uh, but the early members were just an interesting lot, and, and some of them were from school, and, and some of them just showed up out of the community. Yeah, we used to have a pilot, Cleo Hondras. That this would be after mm -hmm. you. But early, early on, and in fact, I think this, the obituary is still up there, back there. But yeah, she was. She was. She worked for. So she worked for the U.S. government. I don't remember what. Um, and she was a pilot. Another thing I remember is that she did discover. She did finally find the um, membership mail that the cat had knocked behind. Some piece of furniture. She was doing registration for us one year. Um, but I do know, yeah, she she earned a eh, not huge, but she earned an obituary in the Washington Post uh, as a civil servant. Um, can you can both of you tell us more about some other early members? Oh, deep sigh. You know, yeah, it's, it's, well, it's, you know, okay. Um, Early members were, you know, that I can remember Pat Kelly and Mike Owings. Um, I mentioned the Andrews. I'm not sure that they did much more than attend. Um, oh. There was a lawyer. He, 
I wrote my own will, but he got he took it to him, and he said, "Well, I wouldn't have done it quite this way, but it works." And got his uh, Mike, 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 Mike. I can't remember. So we had a lawyer. Well, then, we had a satellite engineer. One of the founders is Ron Bounds, okay, who unfortunately yeah. is sort of like. He lives in seclusion. He hasn't reached out a whole lot, although he's been oh, to a he's couple. Oh, he's still alive? Yeah, he's still alive. He and I are the only surviving among the founders. And, and Ron was like one of my good friends in high school. He lived in an apartment, as I recall, a third floor apartment in the 800 block of Park Avenue. And uh, sometimes after a meeting, we would go to his apartment and go up to the roof and he had a telescope but I can't say that he was looking at the stars. There was a sorority house nearby. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Ron Bounds ended up becoming an engineer for ComSat. And he's the only science fiction fan I knew who went into the business of putting satellites in orbit. And he had a great story about one, one of his satellites was going up and he was at the launch, not away from it, he was actually sitting on top of a gantry near the launch pad and witnessing this, his rocket going up. And I thought, wow, that's a science fiction fan who really made good. You know, Ron was yeah, there. here, he was here for our 40th and our 50th not, anniversary again. celebrations. He didn't make it for the 60th, but he's still around. He's living in Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, there, there was, one time, Jack heard about an elderly guy who had died and his family was selling his collection of science fiction. And uh, he and Ron had the money and I didn't have much, but we pulled our money to see if we could buy this entire collection that this guy had. A lot of it was signed copies. And unfortunately, because I had the least amount of money, I could only pick third. So Jack would pick a book, Ron would pick a book, and then I would get the third book. But I did end up with a first edition signed copy of The Demolished Man by Alfred, ah, okay. Alfred Bester, among other things. I never knew if the signature was legitimate until I went to a science fiction convention and Bester was there and I had the book with me. And I said, I'm just curious whether, you know, this is like your signature. And he said, well, let me, let me sign something for you. So he signed his business card and it was exact match for the, the one in the book which eventually I sold for about a hundred bucks, which, you know, somebody had, had a copy that wasn't great. This was in dust jacket and it was in mint condition. There's another thing that I bought because of chalker and, and it was a discon one in 1963 and they had a pile of books on a table in the front of their convention program room and it was first editions of fantasy press books, including all of the uh, Doc Smith Galactic Patrol books. And he said, you should buy some of those and get them signed. That's Doc Smith sitting right there in the second row. So I picked up a paperback and a hardback first edition of, of Galactic Patrol, which is a seminal book in science fiction in terms of taking science fiction and, and out into the universe beyond our solar system, that that was not common in early science fiction. And, and Doc Smith was the one who popularized that. So I still have the hardback and I gave the soft cover to Jack's widow, Eva, because I thought she might need it and she could sell it if she needed right. money or whatever, because I kind of owed it to Jack that I bought this thing. But I'm still sitting. And what I remember about Doc Smith was they handed him the books to sign and he didn't just sign his name. He wrote like three or four paragraphs in the inscription in green ink. Oh. Yeah. I guess we're going to have to wrap up soon, but can you, I know you were talking a bit about um, you know, Balticon Con 1 and 2. Can you tell us more about the, 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 19, the, the Balticons in the 1960s? I wish I could. Okay. Because of time, you know, that, that, memories fade and it becomes this melange of going to parties right. and being up all night and being crazy. I remember the world cons better in terms of just, but you know, the first, Balt, the first 
Baltimore World Con, you know, even that is like a dim memory now. It's, it's been so long. No, Shirley wouldn't want you to remember it, so. <laughs> Nin 1983, I remember pretty well because I was in a wheelchair. I was almost killed in a car crash a couple of weeks okay. before that happened. Mm -hmm. The guy crossed the center line and hit me head on at 40 miles an hour while I was trying to make a turn into a shopping center. You know, I woke up with somebody reaching through the car window saying, you okay, I, buddy? I'm, I'm, I'm having real fun with Geico right now. All that, yeah. so far they've paid for it, except yeah. for the, the deductible, but. But anyway, so, so I, can, I can remember that pretty well. I remember Jim Henson was there. Ooh. And, and some of his Muppets were on display in the, con, in the relatively new Baltimore Convention Center. Wow. And I didn't get a chance to talk to him. And then it wasn't that long afterwards when he died because he didn't pay attention to the fact that he was sick. And, and he got the flu and pneumonia and he was gone way too young. But, you know, he was at our science fiction convention. And of course, he was a Maryland kid, yeah. you know. Yeah, and they have a statue of him with the Muppets, you know, on yeah, the Yeah, you know, there's the a Henson... Um, the Muppets display the, the, at the Maryland Historical Society. Yeah. yeah. Or the Maryland Center for History and Culture, oh, I think, sorry. is their new name. Oh, God, but, yeah. yeah, I get jumped on for that. But, you know, there are just so many I, remarkable I people that have come to Baltimore, that have been part the of the conventions. Uh, you name anybody in science fiction... And they're famous that they came to Baltimore, and it was probably because of the club. I have a, a, an autograph copy of a book by Arthur C. Clarke, and he was in Baltimore, and they had a signing at the power plant, what was it, the Barnes & Noble at the power plant, and he was there. And I only vaguely remember him sitting in a wheelchair. That's, you know, just sort of the vaguest of memories of getting it signed. I got a couple of books signed by Ursula Le Guin. Who knew she'd end up on a postage stamp? <laughs> you know, like yeah. extraordinary people in literature oh, yeah. have come through Baltimore and it's because this club exists and, and has done so well and continues to promote science fiction and fantasy and the outgrowth of it. It's, it's just it's been wonderful. Well, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for I hope there's something. I guess you edit it down. Oh, yeah. 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 I only wish, wish that I it wasn't so something. damn long ago and, and that, you know, memories tend to yeah. fade. Well, or that there were a number of years, like there's this legend about some disastrous election and Busfus broke apart and then went into hiatus and then was reformed. I don't remember any of that. Because that was during the period when I wasn't closely involved with the club at all. Yeah. And I can't say I'm really close now other than I come on rare occasions. You come for the anniversary, is that? That yeah. counts. And, and in a meeting or two, and you know. Well, people talk about you, so you are, um, that, so you are still around in our, in our thoughts. Yeah, and I'm hoping I'll be here for the 70th so I can make my annual speech, <laughs> which is I have proof of the existence of time travel. Okay. The proof lies in its drawbacks. The first drawback is that it only goes in one direction, <laughs> and the second one is it happens too quickly. And, and, ah, and never mind. Yeah. Have you noticed that with age, <laughs> yeah, time yeah. accelerates? Oh, gosh. Yeah, I don't know how I got to be 77 fucking years old. I have no idea. In my head, I'm still in my 40s. And I still act like a teenager sometimes. It's like nuts. And, yes, and being daylight savings time ending day, um, it's kind of appropriate. Yeah, I'm glad I had that extra hour. There, there, we may talk about a part two at some point, but not today. 